Hello, everyone. My name is Michel. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm delighted to host Dr. Wayne Markman, who is the CEO of Symbix, a leading provider of light therapy devices for Parkinson's. Dr. Markman and I will discuss how and why light therapy should be used for Parkinson's disease. But before we start, I would like to remind everyone that this session is for information and education purposes only. So if you're seeking medical advice, please make sure that you consult a medical professional. You have heard me say that many times before. There will, of course, be time for questions at the end of the presentation, which will be very interesting. If you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom, of, the bottom of your screen. Please do not put questions on the chat. Use the Q&A function, please. <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know us yet, No Silver Bullet is managed by Mark and by myself with the aim of sharing Parkinson's expertise. We really aim to help you and frankly, to motivate you to become well-informed general, generalists in your condition in order to make informed choices on how to adapt your lifestyle to manage your symptoms and slow down disease progression. This is about giving you the information you need to make your own choices. We post the recordings of our webinars on YouTube and on Spotify, and we also post short videos on TikTok and on Instagram. The details are available in the chat section on the right of your screen, and it's also available on our website, nosilverbullet4pd.com, nosilverbullet number 4pd.com. <clears throat> but let's come back to today's topic and to Dr. Markland, who I will be calling Wayne. Wayne, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to the No Silver Bullet community today. I will start by my asking pleasure, you, my pleasure. And thank you for the early start as well, because it's 7 a.m. in Sydney, as I said. I will start by asking you if you could tell us a bit more about yourself. And in particular, I would be interested to know how you did become involved with Parkinson's disease. And when did you start focusing on light therapy itself? Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy, so happy to be here. Um, you, you guys have created a fabulous platform, a productive platform. And whilst um, I do agree at this point in time, there is no silver bullet. You, you definitely have a skill, which is finding the silver linings. Um, and there are always silver linings and light therapy is, is one of them. So thank you for shining that light on, on the Parkinson's community. Um, and, and please don't underestimate the value of what you two guys do. Um, it has an enormous effect. Thank you. Um, so how did I get here? Well, well, here is the combination, the, the end result of a lifetime spent in business. Uh, I went to Harvard Business School. I was in finance for many years. I always had a, a deep, deep interest in the biological sciences, uh, biochemistry, went back to do graduate studies in medical science, left the finance world to do something that was far more um, enriching, caring, uh, aligned to my values. Um, and those are the values I've brought to Symbix. Now, Symbix, it's a big mission, right? And, and if you don't have a big mission, uh, I don't think uh, you're, you're spending your time wisely. So personally, my mission, which is now Simbix's mission, is to reduce suffering from Parkinson's globally. Um, we don't have a cure, uh, but we are reducing both non-motor and motor symptoms in different cohorts of Parkinson's. And, and that requires uh, putting yourself out there. It requires research. It requires money to invest. Um, so I've brought my business skills and my medical background into uh, a, a, a business which is, which is small, which is growing, but is making a big difference. So we were at World Parkinson's Congress in July. We are running clinical trials all over the world. Um, it, is, it is really the life's work. Uh, my father-in-law, grandfather, aunt, uncle, all passed away with Parkinson's. So it's a personal, it's a personal story. My father-in-law's situation, his name was Ken. Ken lived in Melbourne, uh, passed away at the age of 72, had Parkinson's and 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 Lewy body dementia for approximately the last 10 years of his life. So he was a young man. Um, I knew nothing about Parkinson's at that point, and I never had a medical background. So I saw a man who did not receive uh, an integrative holistic approach. He, he was given a medication, more medication, and even more medication, and he suffered. He never got to see his family. 
Um, I saw my wife suffer as a consequence of watching her father suffer. And my wife joined the board of Parkinson's, uh, our state chapter, New South Wales, is now part of Parkinson's Australia. Um, it's a deep mission uh, that we share as a family and in honour of my father-in-law. So that's why I do what I do. But it took a lifetime of skill building to get to this point. Right. Thank you very much. This is an amazing background. And I wanted everyone to hear about it so that we understand basically the motivation behind your journey. So thank you very much for sharing those personal details. My pleasure. Um, moving on to, I would say, the, the scientific principles behind light therapy. Can you tell us a bit more about how light therapy affects the body? Um, we know, for instance, it has impact on the mitochondria, on the neurons. How does it work? Okay. I think the first thing to unpack is that light therapy is a medically approved intervention. So the Simpix devices are medical devices. Um, in Europe, for example, where you guys are, it, the devices are listed under the European Medical Directory, um, and they're approved for home use. So effectively, what you're using is a very safe, complementary therapy, which complements existing modalities such as uh, levodopa therapy, exercise. There are some fantastic uh, research results that we will be announcing in a week. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about Simpix's research program, um, which looks at exercise and light therapy and how complementary they are. Um, so light therapy is basically the combination of physics and biochemistry. Okay. So we're harnessing red and infrared oh i have a uh, <laughs> fantastic fantastic background i don't know how that happened but it looked very cool <laughs> and, and it was it was you, pre you, it was on cue yeah, it actually was you, on you said cue. light therapy the background changed <laughs> for once for once my kids will be uh, impressed with my technical <laughs> skills um, so it's a combination of physics and biochemistry. So the physics is basically harnessing the red and infrared light spectrum, which is part of white light. So when you walk out into the sunlight, it, it, we're seeing the rainbow, but we see it as white light. And it has all the colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. We're taking the red and slightly outside of red infrared, and we're putting it into a laser device that emits red and infrared light. And that's the physics, right? It's nothing more than that. It's a wave of photons, a wave of energy. Um, the biochemistry is all about the gut microbiome and the bacteria that live in the gut. And we're using that laser to stimulate that gut bacteria as well as mitochondria. And there is a cascade of really helpful benefits that result from that protocol, that using that light on the gut. Um, so so th this is uh, an area where there are over 6,000 peer-reviewed papers now showing both safety and efficacy. We're no longer in the experimentation phase. Uh, we're showing light has an impact on both motor and non-motor skills. Uh, uh, deficits in Parkinson's. We'll talk about that. I have a slide a bit later on, which will we'll talk to exactly what symptoms are being improved. But this is uh, this is simply another intervention to the nervous system, to the gut bacteria, and to the circadian rhythm of the gut bacteria, which governs your sleep cycle. So in a, in a nutshell, that's what light therapy is. But I want to leave you with the, the uh, understanding. It's approved. It's very high safety profile. There are no reports of serious adverse outcomes. And when you work with Symbix, because of our investment in having a clinical team around the world, we take that very seriously. It's a medical therapy and we work with our customers to make sure that that therapy is optimized. So we, we don't just sell a device and, and you're on your way. We will work with the patient. Maybe is it worth, uh, um, before we go any further, clarifying that there are two devices, actually. One that is the one that you're using for the gut and then the red light therapy mm. itself for yeah. the brain. Do you want to maybe just yeah. clarify this point? Because not everyone will be familiar with your product range. Yeah, no, absolutely. Can I share my screen briefly? Yes, please. Go ahead. All right. Well, uh... no, that's my little puppy who's now a mm -hmm. big dog. Um, so the Symbix devices 
include, I would say this is our a range for Parkinson's. Um, this PD care, you can see my cursor there, that's the hero product. That is essentially the base therapy. And it, it, it's really a small handheld device. Okay, and you turn it on and you'll see it comes on. You place that on the gut and we have developed a protocol which has been published. So we're only using published peer-reviewed protocols. Okay, um, and that is placed on the stomach for 18 minutes, three times a week. And I'll show you a little schedule next. Um, and that's the, the handheld laser. Uh, this is the Duo Care 904. This is uh, the supercharged version of the PD Care. So if you want to do the therapy three times more quickly, it also costs three times more. You don't need to. There's no other added benefit to using the middle one. It's just more expensive because it's faster. It's uh, it's it, it just works more quickly. It's a higher intensity uh, output. Um, so that's directed towards the gut. And we'll talk a bit about the gut-brain axis and the research behind it uh, and, and what we're doing, the additional trials we're involved in. And then you have the helmet device, which is on the right-hand side. That's a Symbix Neuro. Now, that device, and you've, you've probably seen other helmet devices out there on the market. Uh, I would like to talk about differences between uh, devices such as the Neuro and other devices about vagus nerve stimulation. We'll get to that in a, in a while. But this is essentially the device. It's really easy to use. It's really light, really friendly, nice and airy, but super effective. You put it on your head and you will use that. Now, I'll just turn it on. Um, just very briefly, because it can be annoying to watch. Can you mm. see that? Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you very much. So that you would wear uh, Monday through Friday once a day. And the, the whole therapy is around 24 minutes. You can use them simultaneously. Although we do start people uh, using just one device first, and then you add another device later on. So the combined protocol of the two devices would be you use the laser device on three separate days during the week. We want a day rest in between uh, uh, uses because we're working on the gut biochemistry and you're stimulating uh, the production of these metabolites, which help us with our keeping our metabolism healthy, called short-chain fatty acids. So these short-chain fatty acids are the consequence, the, the end result of your digestive process. And this laser will increase that production, right? And there are a whole bunch of benefits we get from those short chain fatty acids. So we want a day rest in between uses. We want to use it on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Alternatively, you could use it on a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. There's no magic to the three days, That's but nice. you have a day rest in between. And then the helmet you would use once a day. So you'd use them together on a Monday, together on a Wednesday, together on a Friday. Together, it would take about 24 minutes to use them both at the same time. And then on the other days, 24 minutes just for the helmet. So that's the protocol. Obviously, um, you, you know, we'd give the protocol to somebody who, who purchased the devices, go away for 12 weeks, okay? This is, not, this is not the typical experience you have when you go and see a neurologist once a year. It's not come back in a year's time and we'll adjust your medication. This is go away for 12 weeks. Let's assess where you're at. And then because we have this commitment to a clinical support team, we will work with you to optimize this protocol. So how are you sleeping? Are we using the devices at the right time of the day? Are we stimulating vagus nerve in the case of the helmet at the right time of day to increase rest and your sleep? Um, no, let's change it around. So we have a lot of experience. We have over 5,000 customers around the world. So in addition to the clinical trials, we have, uh, we're building a wealth of knowledge around how these devices uh, interfere with Parkinson's progression, how they work on various symptoms and how to problem shoot. So if you're having a problem, we can get around it two or three different ways. And that's why much, we're, we're so strong on the customer and clinical support. 
Thank you very much. I just wanted everyone to see the product so that we know what we're talking about. Can I just ask you if you don't mind to stop sharing the screen for a second? And we come, we'll come back to the slides later on, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Done. Yep. So let's just, let's mm -hmm. just focus maybe more on the gut-brain connection and, and basically why Symbix is focusing on that gut-brain connection. And I'm sure you may want to talk about the vagus nerve therapy in particular as well and how it relates to Parkinson's disease. So if you want to maybe cover the gut brain and the, the vagus nerve therapy as one answer, if it's possible. Of course. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm going to go back and share my screen. Mm -hmm. This is the um, part of the discussion where you do need to unpack a little bit. Um, so for those of you who who don't know i mean this is a very simple slide right this just says there is a connection between the brain the gut <laughs> and the microbiota or the microbiome which are the bacteria and algae fungi etc that live inside the gut uh in the colon so those sausages right um so the the physical connection between all of that is essentially the vagus nerve the vagus nerve vagus is latin for wandering it's the wandering nerve it goes from your brain stem uh it's a 10th cranial nerve it goes all the way to every organ in the body down the left hand side the right hand side if you're looking at me uh, and it goes to the gut and it innervates the gut there is also a brain inside the digestive tract all the way from you know, the mouth down to the rectum and anus. And the majority of those neurons live in the gut, and that's called the enteric nervous system. It's our third brain. And we know that there's bidirectional communication. There's communication going from your brain down and your gut up. And we also know that most of the communication is from the gut up to the brain. So that's the afferent signaling from the gut. The efferent signaling with an E is from the brain down to your motor system. The efferent signaling is your sensory system, which gives information. It conveys information back up to the, the brain. So there's more efferent, I'm sorry, more afferent signaling there is efferent signaling. Um, so we've heard expressions, you know, we are what we eat. Uh, is this neurologically speaking as well? Well, absolutely, yes. The answer is yes. We are what we eat and we think uh, according to what we eat. If you give a child with uh, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, sugar, the symptoms are much worse. If you give them a healthy diet, it's far more under control. So clinical trials with light will start to be uh, published on autism, attention, deficit, hyperactivity. The, you definitely are what you eat. Um, now, why is this important? Because it works. That's why. Because don't believe me. This is a, this is a snapshot of my social media from the last year and a half. Okay. Uh, I didn't write any of these. This is a mixture of primary peer-reviewed research, as well as uh, an article in the BBC based on a, a peer-reviewed research study done in the UK, um, something that Bath Blom reposted. You'll all be familiar, I believe he's on next month. Um, so, does Parkinson's disease begin in the gut? Yale University Medical School published a piece on this. Um, so there's evidence, right? Now, what's the quality of the evidence? We're always trying to get behind the quality. Evidence for the sake of evidence is not compelling enough. So I think the first hypothesis that that certainly um, started me thinking about this was Per Borghammer, who is a Scandinavian researcher, presented at Will Parkinson's Congress in Barcelona this year. Brain first, gut first, Parkinson's disease. Um, the majority of uh, people with Parkinson's, he hypothesizes, that's really important, we don't have evidence yet at this stage, but we're still hypothesizing. So this is the first academic model that that I think is the most compelling one around 2019. And he talks about the aggregation of uh, pathological alpha synuclein clumps of proteins originating in the enteric system or the gut. Pathological means that it's disease causing uh, alpha synuclein proteins are, are, are normal. You need alpha synuclein proteins in nerve synapses. It, it's the, it contributes to healthy functioning of nerves. But when they start to clump, that's not normal. 
Why do they clump? Well, Parkinson's Disease Journal this year, uh, January, uh, published this report. Bas Blom reposted this because he's a wonderful uh, um, proponent of bans on glyphosate, um, uh, rotenone, other herbicides, pesticides. I'm going to unpack this in the next slide, but he posted on this and it talks about the pathological process of bacteria in the gut, inflammation and leakage of these alpha synuclein clumps that go to the brain. The Lancet published a piece this year. So it's in the Lancet. That process is published in the Lancet. Um, this report here uh, in Psychiatrist uh, magazine, based on a clinical study that was peer reviewed, shows that there is a this year there was a 500% increase in Parkinson's clusters linked to dry cleaning chemicals. So there is a chemical called TCE, trichloroethylene. Trichloroethylene or TCE is a solvent. So when you have a spot on a white shirt and you take it into the dry cleaners, how do they get rid of the spot? They use an industrial strength solvent, which causes Parkinson's. So yes, my advice is stop getting your clothes dry cleaned. And for, for goodness sake, don't go and work in a dry cleaning uh, 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 shop. And don't let your kids go and work in dry cleaners. So let's unpack this bottom right-hand corner the more. So this is the straight from the Journal of Parkinson's Disease, and this is what uh, Professor Blom published, uh, uh, sorry, uh, commented on, uh, because he's an advocate for reduction of pesticides and herbicide use. So uh, it looks complicated. It's actually not. So here you go. Using pesticides, glyphosate, uh, which is a weed killer, so is paraquat. Rotenone is a uh, insecticide. So all in the food chain, right? So rotenone is on fruit and vegetables as, if you're not eating organic and not everyone can afford or wants to eat organic. So you're ingesting, you are ingesting, we are ingesting these toxins. There's a direct effect on the nervous system and there's an indirect effect. The gut brain axis is the bottom part, the indirect effect. The direct effect is you ingest it, you inhale it, you breathe it in through your nose, through your mouth, or in the food chain, and it directly affects the dopaminergic cells in your central nervous system. So it kills dopamine cells all the way through to the substantia nigra. Um, then there's a, a, a direct effect through the enteric nervous system, which is in the gut, as well as in the microbiome. So the right-hand side talks about just the microbiome part of it. And effectively, I'll summarize that so we don't have to unpack the slide. It is increasing inflammation in the gut. The inflammation in the gut is leading to leaky gut, which is not a psychosomatic condition. It's a physiological condition. So when you say I have leaky gut and you have symptoms of bloating, gas, pain, distension, you are no longer appropriate for a psychologist. You're actually reporting physiological symptoms that manifest as IBS, leaky gut syndrome. Those are real, real symptoms. They're not in your head, they're in your gut. Once you have inflammation in the gut junction, you have leakage of that bacteria that should live in the gut. It's healthy. The right proportion of bacteria is healthy. We need it to survive. We need it for digestion and to absorb nutrition from our food. But if you have leaky gut lining and bacteria leaking through, that bacteria is eroding the blood-brain barrier. So leaky gut goes along with a compromised blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a filtration system which stops toxins from entering the brain. If you have clusters of alpha synuclein proteins that are clumping in your gut or your spinal column, your spinal cord, or in the vagus nerve, they're actually going through a compromised blood-brain barrier. And that is a leading cause of dopaminergic death and Lewy body dementia, even Alzheimer's dementia. And I have a slide on that next. Um, so John Cryan 
talks about, he's a very famous microbiome researcher out of uh, County Cork, University College Cork in Ireland. Um, study finds a link between the gut and Alzheimer's. Big news this year. So they basically took uh, fecal matter from mice that were uh, given uh, toxic fecal matter, induced dementia, symptoms of dementia, loss of memory, um, or extraordinary behavior, motor symptoms, and they transplanted it in healthy mice, and the healthy mice developed the same symptoms. So we, we know the gut is directly linked to our brain health. Now, why? One more comment, Michelle, if you if you will indulge Please. me on the left hand side. Then I want to talk about the vagus nerve and the the, the uh, interaction of the vagus nerve in Parkinson's to round out the answer to your question. So this is really interesting. Okay, the left hand side: um, gastrointestinal barriers to levodopa transport. Uh, and absorption in Parkinson's disease. Now, I just want to read it because it, I can't say this any more uh, uh, articulately or profoundly than the researcher here. They do a great job. Levodopa is the gold standard for the symptomatic treatment of Parkinson's. We agree we are not replacing or suggesting you replace levodopa with light therapy. Uh, the no silver bullet for PD, the mantra. I mean, it's it's aligned with my personal views, values, and that of Symbix's. Um, there are well-documented motor and non-motor fluctuations that occur almost inevitably once levodopa is started uh, after a variable period in people with PD. This is basically saying that... Um, the levodopa fluctuations or the motor and non-motor fluctuations are caused, the second part, by the pathogenesis or the disease process in the gut, which is effectively uh, making that levodopa less available to travel to the brain in the form that the brain needs. So it's activating the levodopa in the gut. How much of the levodopa is activated? There's a study by Harvard University Medical School three years ago. I didn't uh, include it in this presentation, but but it's there, and I can I can I can you know, make it available if people are interested. Up to ninety five percent of your levodopa does not cross the blood brain barrier and is not available for dopamine cells in the brain. Um, ninety-five percent of it is killed in the gut, which is why levodopa is quite toxic, and people feel quite nauseous physically. They physically get sick. Many people have to take drugs to counteract the effects of the levodopa. So this is saying that uh, motor fluctuations and non-motor fluctuations are a result of a dysbiotic gut microbiome, which just means a pathological gut microbiome. Pathological disease state, high inflammation levels in the gut affect the efficacy of the levodopa. So, Bimbix is uh, going to announce a clinical trial in the UK. We're hoping before Christmas we will have to go through an ethics approval process. I won't share with you the uh, research organization, but it's a large UK university and hospital, uh, part of the NHS. We will have 100 plus patients. We will look at the improvements in motor and non-motor symptoms and how they fluctuate during the day using a therapy for the gut microbiome. So the, the, the hypothesis is if we can improve the condition of the gut microbiome, which we know we can with original uh, data that we have from this device, we can increase the amount of levodopa that survives the journey from the gut when you eat it consume, swallow, all the way to the brain. And, and, and that's what we need. We needed to cross the blood-brain barrier in the form of levodopa, not dopamine, because the dopamine is blocked. It won't cross the blood-brain barrier. That so needs the different form to cross it. All right, so that's why the gut-brain axis, Michelle, because the gut-brain axis is no longer a hypothesis. There is very, very credible research already out there. It was a key research stream at Will Parkinson's. Um, 
Yeah, it looks like a rat. It walks like a rat. It smells like a rat and it talks like a rat. Well, what do you conclude? It's probably a rat. Uh, bad example because we use rats on these experiments. But we're now looking at human experiments, uh, human trials, no longer experiments. And because it's a cleared medical device, ethics is not a problem and there's a high safety profile. So we're getting the, the, the clinical data already. Okay, vagus nerve. Um, I've already told you vagus is Latin for wandering. Vagus nerve is one of the key players in the parasympathetic nervous system. So we have a nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. It's on whether we're awake or we're sleeping. It regulates breathing. It regulates temperature. It regulates our response to stress. Um, it regulates digestion. So there are two parts to that. There's the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, and they're in opposition. They're agonists. You need them because, primitively speaking, we need both to survive. Now, the sympathetic is your flight-fight response. If you're in danger, you need to run from the beast who's about to kill you. So your blood vessels constrict. Your heart rate goes up your blood goes out of your gut to your large skeletal muscles so that you can run more quickly. Your eyes focus. Um, your brain pulse rate increases. Your, your acumen, your focus is increased. Um, now, chronic, parasymp uh, uh, chronic sympathetic nervous stimulation is bad for us. We get chronic adrenal fatigue. Our ability to turn off that sympathetic nervous system is compromised in Parkinson's. So stress is uh, uh, a terrible influencer and, and primer of Parkinson's symptoms because you're working under heightened adrenal and cortisol conditions and our symptoms are exacerbated. They're made much worse. The parasympathetic is the opposite. It's the rest and digest. Rest as in sleep, digest as in digestion, right? So predromal symptoms of Parkinson's, which means symptoms before a diagnosis, the predromal symptoms of Parkinson's are apparent up to two decades, often at least one decade before a diagnosis. And there's, an, there's another whole podcast in that uh, diagnostic criteria uh, for Parkinson's and why we're waiting for motor deficits to show. Motor deficits show when you have 60 to 80% death of dopamine producing cells. That's too late. So why aren't we identifying Parkinson's 10 to 20 years earlier based on chronic constipation? That's a predromal symptom based on REM sleep disorder or insomnia, you know, just a fancy word for insomnia. I don't sleep well. I can't go to the bathroom. It's chronic. It's, it, this has per, it's pervasive. It, it's been around for years. Guys, what's going on? Um, uh, take a laxative. No, no. Take a step back and understand your other risk factors for Parkinson's and perhaps go and see a neurologist much earlier. Now, I'm not saying you should be ringing alarm bells, but it should be in the back of one's mind if you've had chronic constipation for years. Uh, the story typically progresses to, ah, you've got Parkinson's, but you should have done something about it 10 years ago. Um, so, yeah, that's a mystery to me. It's a political issue, but the diagnostic criteria sucks and it has to change. We have to identify Parkinson's earlier, which is why the Michael J. Fox Foundation discovery and announcement this year was so profound. Because yes, it's not practical on a population scale yet to do a you know lumbar puncture and draw cerebral spinal fluid out of your spinal column to look for clumping of alpha synuclein proteins as an early marker but that will progress into a blood or a saliva excuse me a um a, yeah a blood test or a saliva test okay so we will be able to start identifying the pathology earlier and perhaps that will lead to earlier diagnosis but 
the, the, the data is there. The information is there. One of the things Simbix uh, is all about, it's, 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 a, it's an ethos of mine, and, and I try and, and you know, uh, motivate and encourage my team to follow this every day. It's to read more deeply and more widely than everyone else out there and talk about uh, the nervous system, talk about nutrition, talk about digestion, talk about exercise. Uh, because these are all critical inputs into somebody's Parkinson's care. And the information's there. The, one of the frustrations for me is that no one puts it all together, which is why I'm so happy to come onto this podcast, Michelle. You're one of the only platforms that puts it all together. And yes, I, I understand sometimes it's pitched above a the, the, the average person, but there's so much out there. The BBC article I showed you is, is really not pitched at a scientist level. It's pitched at the ordinary consumer of BBC news. Thank you, Wayne. Sorry, um, can, I, can I interrupt yeah, you so for a quick second? Because actually, I yeah, think of course actually, you can. Oh, I'm very keen to ask you what improvements you have observed in people who are using the right therapy. But before we do that, I'd like to go back, if we can, in not too, too much time, um, to go back on the effects of lights on the mechanisms you just have highlighted, because I don't want to be jumping too quickly into the personal experience of users. I'd like to understand a bit more how mm -hmm. light therapy can help counter or, or basically impact positively the process that you just highlighted on the gut brain axis. Great. Okay. So uh, you and Mark and I, we're basically warm blooded plants. Okay, so the process that a plant goes through is very similar to the process that a human being under uh, a light will go through. The plant absorbs sunlight and it makes nutrition. It makes glucose. And uh, it, it, it's, that's the nourishment of the plant. That's what the plant needs to grow. And then one of the byproducts is oxygen that the plant spits out. So that's photosynthesis. We're warm-blooded plants. We absorb sunlight. In the case of the laser, we are absorbing concentrated infrared and red light, and we're making energy, and we're breathing out carbon dioxide. Okay? So it's the energy part that's really critical. So we don't make chlorophyll. We don't, we're not green, even though you know, I have the Simbix green on this morning. Um, we absorb the light, and the light stimulates the cell mitochondria, now, in Parkinson's, and I think you will have a session on mitochondria, Parkinson's is widely regarded as a mitochondrial uh, dysfunction. Uh, our mitochondria, which is our battery, doesn't work properly. What the mitochondria does is profound. The mitochondria is just a little part of the cell that produces something called ATP, and it's what drives life. It allows the cell to grow, to regulate itself if it's sick, that's really important, particularly in cancer, right? You've got to be able to regulate pathology. And the cell does that. It recognizes it. It'll either try and kill it or it'll kill itself. And then it'll die. So not to proliferate the, the disease. Um, the mitochondria also governs so many other functions in the body. So let me give you one, one example. Before we go into symptom improvements of, of light therapy, mitochondria sits right next to another little friend called endoplasmic reticulum, ER. Endoplasmic reticulum is another little organelle in the cell. It's responsible for protein synthesis. Those proteins are involved in the sleep cycle. If the mitochondria is not charging the endoplasmic reticulum, the endoplasmic reticulum is not involved in an optimal way in regulating your sleep or your circadian rhythm. Hence, sleep disturbance in Parkinson's. So all of it's coming back to mitochondria. So look, let, let's, let's not unpack it any further because you have to get into deep <clears throat> biochemistry. There are certain yes. proteins and it absorbs it at certain positions. That's a key issue. Another key issue is that it is um, um, anti-inflammatory. So the light stimulates anti-inflammatory cytokines uh, that reduce inflammation in the body. So when you're putting it on the gut, you are stimulating the reduction of inflammation. Now, cold lasers, this is a cold laser. It's a low-level laser. It's a, it's a very safe battery-driven laser. Don't get turned off by the word laser. 
This has been developed by the Scandinavians and has been available for 50 years. Cold laser has been used throughout Northern Europe for 50 years. It was invented in uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 1902, where a Danish doctor won the Nobel Prize in medicine for using cold laser on uh, smallpox scarring. And then you go forward in the 1950s, they invented blue light for treating kids with jaundice. That's, that's laser therapy. That's light therapy. Uh, sorry, not laser. That's light therapy. Okay. So it has a positive effect on, a, on an infant's uh, system for purifying blood, which if it's immature, the toxins build up and the, the child develops jaundice. That's just light, blue light, right? And then Chernobyl, they treated burn victims with red light and they got very good results. And then Symbix now has basically said, right, the light has broader application for neurodegenerative conditions. How do we harness red and infrared light into a device that can be used on the gut and the helmet that can be used on the head and particularly the area closest to the vagus nerve? So your upper neck or cervical spine, it's just a progression, a natural progression of a substance that has been found to be, you know, uh, positive and providing positive health benefits for 120 years. Thank you very much. So it is nothing new. It is just the, the range of it's not new has now been increased to cover. Yeah, exactly. It's not issues. new. It's just, it's just evolved and become far mm. more sophisticated because uh, you've got to have an open learning mind. You you, yes. you you can't do the same thing the same way and expect different results. And we've had no progress for 60 years. Thank you very much, Wayne. And now a question that I, I'm sure will interest our audience highly is what improvements have you observed in Parkinson's patients using the, the light therapy, both in terms of motor skills uh, and non-motor symptoms? And as an addition to that question, um, I'd like to ask you as well if the light therapy is beneficial at all stages of Parkinson's or if it focuses on certain stages only. Um, so I'll start with that. The light does not, does not discriminate. Uh, so we have not run clinical trials with uh, early onset Parkinson's, but we have um, several hundred customers who have early onset and they're getting... Uh, benefits across the, the the board. Not everyone benefits in every area. So it's it's a little unpredictable. It's one of my frustrations, and that's why we're doing more clinical trials, even though it's an approved medical device. We're, we're doing more clinical data because we do need to understand uh, the specific benefits to early onset. We do need to understand the benefits to women uh, versus men. I, th I thought your podcast last month was fabulous. Mm -hmm. I, I listened. I listened to 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 it, and I, I, it's so necessary for half the population. Um, one of the trials we're running in Adelaide. Well, I wouldn't say we. Uh, they're using our devices at Flinders University, and there's a fantastic uh, female researcher by the name of Dr. Joyce Ramos. She will be presenting the results to uh, Symbix and my company and my board next week and at a conference. So they will become public next week. Um, she's showing that in a cohort of exercise plus light therapy, it's as effective compared to an, an exercise cohort only that exercise twice as much. So in English, um, I'm not suggesting you do this, please. This is not medical uh, advice. You could effectively cut your exercise in half and supplement that with light therapy so that you can sit in your bum at home and use the light and it's as effective with half the exercise. Now, I didn't say that and don't record this, Michelle. Um, but <laughs> wait for wait wait for that reason. Mark is smiling because I think that's we put it differently. Yeah, level. we put it differently. If someone is exercising a lot, using light therapy will basically leverage that exercise even further and make it worth maybe twice more. Exactly, which is why you have the podcast and I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we will we will share those results. That's a big deal. That is a big deal because exercise is a an evidence backed intervention with the most amount of evidence out there from all the non pharmaceutical modalities, right? And and this is a big deal. So I, I'm so excited uh, to be involved in that research, or at least have our products be the the focus of that research. Back to your question. Um, these are the documented areas of symptom relief. 
This is not opinion. This is right from the clinical trial data and more to come. We know we have to increase uh, uh, the, the numbers and we are. So I'm going to announce uh, when I talk about our research program, I'm going to announce three new trials, which are going to be fantastic for next year. Um, so improved gait balance and coordination. Uh, one of the trials we just ran uh, or was run with our devices at the Sydney Adventist Hospital, a 60 person, uh, sorry, 40 person randomized control with a placebo. So we had a placebo uh, helmet device. The improvements were in tremor, in um, upper limb coordination, lower limb coordination, gait and facial expression. We had balance in there. COVID hit. We did the testing remotely. It was neurologists did the testing. We were obviously not involved in the trial. It's blinded. Um, so we had to replace balance because you don't want somebody to do a balance test online and and uh, because of false risk. Facial expression. So we had a team of neurologists uh, doing the interventions. And we had, a t so there were two groups, but we had on average, 25% improvement between the two groups. And then the group that continued with the helmet treatment improved another 20%. So we had a 45% improvement over a six month period for the helmet. We had a 25% improvement over the first three months with the helmet. Okay. The non-motor symptoms, not that they're more important, but it's gratifying to see that we are getting non-motor improvements. The, the the two main ones that are uh, are repeated back to us often are constipation and sleep quality. So if you can improve sleep quality and you can reduce constipation, that goes a long way to improving quality of life. The sleep is critical. I mean, sleep deprivation is a form of torture. Um, you want to, you know, manipulate a situation, deprive somebody of sleep. It's a well-tried and tested form of torture. If you're helping somebody to improve their sleep, everything, including mood, including cognition, including energy levels, including circulation, all improve. It's a vicious cycle. So mood, energy, sleep, constipation are the most uh, popular uh, non-motor improvements that we see. This is like any therapy, guys. It, it, this is, um, th it has an efficacy curve that follows a normal distribution pattern. You've got high responders, moderate responders, and low responders. Uh, so, so it's not a panacea, but we're very transparent that you can expect some improvements. Now, which improvements? Need to do more uh, research. We, we I can't answer that with with uh, with more conviction than I already have. The one other uh, point, Michelle, I would add before uh, mm -hmm. I think we're done on this topic, is that we're following a cohort of people with Parkinson's in Adelaide, Australia. We've reported, or the scientists at least involved in the study, reported after three years maintenance of symptoms that they were no worse off after three years. They're about to do the testing for the fourth year. It's a calendar year. So in December, I believe they will be going over to Adelaide to retest the, the cohort. They're expecting no deterioration after four years. Um, we need to do a larger uh, study. And, and the studies I'm going to talk about next year will be much larger. Uh, it's going to be amazing to demonstrate that in a hundred person cohort, but that is the first signs that we've seen besides exercise that it could be disease modifying. It could help maintain at least the status quo, which is very interesting. Thank you, Wayne. I think that uh, I want to talk about the clinical trials a bit more. I think you, you stand aside at Simbix by the fact that you do invest in clinical trials, which not everyone does. And obviously, you, you're helping the whole industry, so to speak, and the whole community in doing so. Can you tell us a tiny bit more about the, you've touched on that. I don't know if you want to add anything on the clinical trials you have done already and what you have learned, although you covered that point, I think, partly at least. Um, and maybe also interestingly, the clinical trials that are coming up. I see your slide there. What is, so if you can take us through what you have done so far and what you're sure, doing, that would be great. Sure. 
I think um, I think the overall comment I want to make here is uh, evidence is at the core of syndics. We we you cannot build a a reputable uh, I, I get medical device which you know it, it doesn't even have to be reputable. It has to pass efficacy and safety standards. So you need clinical trial data for medical devices. So that's a given. But I our philosophy is everything is evidence based because then we just go right back to the evidence. If people want to know which symptoms, we just point to the evidence. If people want to know the percentage that, that respond, we point to the evidence. So it makes our lives easier. And yes, you're right. It's critical for the industry, for the the, the community with Parkinson's to have more clinical trials. Um, not all clinical trials are useful. And there's a whole discussion to be had around how clinical trials stifle creativity. Um, and I have sympathy for that because there are guidelines and you have to work within the guidelines and the guidelines don't reward uh, uh, creativity to a large extent. But we have to we have to invest in clinical trials. Um, so we raised money a couple of years ago and I've put all of that money into clinical trials and into devices that have regulatory approvals. The three clinical trials on the left-hand side completed, the two yellow and the one orange, were the trials I've already talked about in Adelaide, Australia, in Sydney. The population sizes are quite small, but the effect size was large. And that shows improvements in motor and non-motor symptoms. Uh, the journals uh, are there as well in the top right-hand corner. So, you know, personalized medicine, BMC neurology, those are published. The helmet trial in the uh, teal colored in the middle the sand hospital which was a randomized blinder trial 40 participants published in a, a journal of clinical medicine jcm that shows uh the improvements in those five motor skills that i've already talked about and that is first three months of that trial have been published second three months are being submitted for publication, I believe now by the scientists. We're hoping that will be published by Christmas. But that that inf that that uh, publication is is available already for the first half of the trial. Um, the four trials at the bottom, two are ongoing, and I want to talk about those because I mentioned Dr. Joyce Ramos from Flinders University. She's an exercise physiologist, a PhD. Uh, who found out about photobiomodulation. And it's a really creative trial. There are groups of patients uh, going from placebo devices to exercise only to exercise plus the Symbix devices. And she will be announcing the first results of that trial. Now, though it's still preliminary because, you know, for the publication, they do reserve the right to change the results. But Broadly speaking, those results are what they are and will be you've got a high efficacy rate when you exercise and you do the Symbix protocol. So that is as good as exercising every day of the week. But if you're exercising every day and you're using the devices, uh, which is what Michelle said, that is optimal. So that's going to be published. Now, when you say N equals 24, we're talking about it's not 24 data points, it's 24 people rotating between five different groups. So you've got over 100 data points. Um, the, the sort of lemon-colored Ontario, Canada, this is a trial that we are completing now, this month, in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. And the team there have been looking at uh, uh, the benefits of the helmet and the laser, on a cohort of 60 people with Parkinson's, um, all stages one, two, and three. So no late stage, hence my comment about the need to, to increase the variety of the trials we're investing in. Um, I don't know what the early data says, very exciting. Uh, that's a big deal. That is a really big deal. That was that, That's the largest blinded with a placebo arm trial conducted to date. Um, with the light devices. So we will have a publication in Q1 of next year, and those results will be uh, disclosed at 
you know, the uh, the International Movement Disorder Conference in Philadelphia later on next year, the American Neurological Association, which I think is in the first half of next year. Um, but that trial is completed. We are now in the process of statistical analysis and data gathering. So the two blue uh, boxes at the bottom right-hand corner are the new trials that I that I want to announce. Um, I'm not going to disclose our partner yet because we still have an ethics process to go through, and the ethics will be the first half of next year, and we will go into uh, pay, uh, uh, participant selection, recruiting in the second half, and we hope to get going at the end of next year in these two trials. There will be a 100-person-plus trial, uh, at a large UK university with a hospital attached, with a, a large Parkinson's uh, uh, cohort. Um, we will be looking at motor and non-motor improvements and medication efficacy. So we're basically looking at motor and non-motor fluctuations during the day to determine um, whether laser improves or uh, smooths out the effect of the levodopa, which is why I showed you that slide about um, you know only one to five percent of the levodopa remains intact and crosses the blood-brain barrier to help a person who's on the therapy. Um, that's a big, big investment of resources, time, and, and very exciting. The bottom box, again, I won't disclose who our partner is. Uh, in fact, Michelle and Mark, when you guys called me and said, how would you like to be on the November episode? I was busy in China uh, with mm -hmm. this with this trial. We're going to run a clinical trial on a post-DBS cohort. I saw briefly, I'm going to preempt one of the questions, which was, you know, can you use this if you have DBS? Um, yes, you can use the laser because it's directed towards the gut. We don't want you to use the helmet just yet because it, we don't have enough data even though um, we do have over 5,000 people around the world using the devices, many of them are naughty and use it. People with Parkinson's are extraordinarily stubborn. Um, they will do what they want to do. They're delightful. They're uh, highly, highly motivated, uh, uh, you know, case in point here on this, on this podcast. Uh, we have so many people who have DBS that are using the helmet. It's just red light, guys. I mean, you know, let's let's just be be honest with it. It's just red light. Um, but we won't recommend it because we don't have a clinical trial, and that's really important. Everything we do has to come back to the evidence. But the laser is perfectly safe to use. So we will we will look at non-motor improvements. We, we're going to be looking at pain. We're going to be looking at constipation. And we're going to be looking at improving sleep quality in a cohort of DBS uh, recipients who have had DBS between six and 12 months ago, who are stable, who have non-motor symptoms that the DBS does not address and would benefit enormously from um, improvements in those three areas. Now, we've already uh, commenced a pilot part of that just to make sure the devices are working properly the communications working the reporting's working so that's ongoing uh we have the most wonderful partners there and we will move into the full ethics application clinical trial next year so we're more than quadrupling the data points that we already have now yes this is a huge investment but it's worth it it's it's worth the investment because we're going to be uh, looking at DBS. We're going to be looking at uh, young onset. I haven't quite uh, secured that trial, but we will do a trial in young onset because it's yes, it's a it's a it's a smaller percentage, but boy, it's an important one. Um, and we will be looking at the effect at, in the. Uh, the, the Flinders trial on both the overall cohort as well as the female cohort. So that'll be part of the the publication. Thank you, Wayne. Thank um, you so very Michelle, much. Uh, yeah, last last comment. You know, we yes. we do have experience from over five thousand people with Parkinson. So the, the 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 clinical data is important, but it's not everything. We are experienced in working with a very large customer base and grow, excuse me, growing every day.
Thank you very much. Let's move to a very practical question, actually. If among our audience tonight, people are interested in starting, starting light therapy, what options are available? And maybe if you can help us maybe paint the picture beyond just the Symbix products, because there is a variety mm -hmm. of products on the market. There is pads, there is helmets. Some people have nasal devices and the price range is very yep. also tremendously. And in doing yep. so, maybe can you help us also tell us how Symbix products are different from the rest? Okay, um, look, uh, I'll leave the slide up because then you can just scan that uh, QC code, QR code and go right to um, the newsletter and, and we will send twice a month a newsletter with the latest research and the latest findings and the latest protocols. Um, and that's if you want to contact us, the Simbix website and then info things by them. Okay, great question. Um, I started this business and this business now is, uh, has a big mission, which is to reduce Parkinson's suffering around the world. Um, we are not about selling another device or two more or three more to somebody who doesn't need the device or, you know, has found a cheaper alternative. Um, so when you call us, you will get transparent, honest, straightforward uh, advice and the device sometimes is not what the person wants to hear the device sometimes is if you are only interested in reducing your tremor in your left finger I, I, I don't mean to be patronizing but we do get questions like I have a tremor in my left hand uh, will you guarantee me that the device will reduce my tremor the answer is no sir or or madam oh, we can't guarantee that so if you are not going to mortgage the house or sell your car to buy the laser, there is no downside. We strongly recommend that you will feel better with the therapy, with the, the light device, the helmet. Give it a go. Um, but we're not going to promise that it will reduce the tremor. We get lots of questions around, uh, look, guys, I found a red light pad on eBay for 250 bucks. Should I go for it? And the answer, honestly, is no, you shouldn't go for it. And here's why. There are medical devices and there are non-medical devices. There are, you get what you pay for. What you're getting when you go through Symbix is you're getting devices that are the subject of clinical trials. Every device that we sell has been involved in a clinical trial. So we have safety and we have efficacy data. We understand how it works and it's it's a high quality device. They've all got safety testing. They've all got emissions testing. They've all got biocompatibility testing. These are all requirements for high quality devices. So when we say that this laser is 904 nanometers and it delivers, a pulse rate of X and a frequency of Y and a uh, intensity in terms of joules per square centimeter per minute of Z. It does what we say it does. We can't stand behind somebody else's product and say after three years of use, that's what it will do. If you're paying bargain basement prices, the chances are that it won't be delivering a therapeutic dose and then you're wasting your time. Now, you might get a um, psychic benefit, a placebo benefit, and there is a placebo benefit in light, guys. Um, in that, in that uh, SAN trial, we measured a placebo improvement, but we also measured an, uh, an improvement over placebo for the live device, the Symbix device. So you get what you pay for, and that's the difference between a company investing in research and that has a commitment to a clinical support team around the world. We're going to help you make a decision. If that decision is not right for you, we, you know, we get lots of questions about Parkinsonisms and, you know, progressive nuclear palsy, uh, issues we don't have any research on, and it pains me, but... Uh, look, we don't have data. We're so sorry. Um, best of luck to you. Uh, we can't recommend this device for you. Uh, not everyone's going to do that. So if you find a cheap device, please understand what the technical parameters are, where it's made, what the reputation of the company is. Do they have a clinical support team that you can contact? Um, there is high quality and then there is rubbish. Um, there are some other devices out there if if somebody gets a device 
and we've had this many times, and they say, should I upgrade to the Symbix? The answer is that no, that your device is perfectly adequate, will do the job. To be honest, we don't know of any other devices out there with clinical trial data. So um, if you're happy with it, great. But we'll tell you, there's no clinical data on that device. We're the only company with the clinical data for Parkinson's. Excellent. So please, please keep that in mind. That's the difference between a Symbix device and an alternative device. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, in all fairness to audience, and I, I just want to hear widen the scope a tiny bit, is that we have other videos on our YouTube channel where you can see some other products. But uh, uh, I think that uh, I do agree with what Wayne just said. But indeed, you can find more information about other solutions on our channel, on our YouTube channel. Uh, I, I had a few more questions for you, Wayne, but I think in all fairness, I will stop here because I would like to go and look at the questions from our audience. We have quite a few that have sure. already been adding up there and uh, we are slightly more than an hour into our session. Um, I see a question here from Emma. Do you see the questions, Wayne? Uh, no, but I'll go into okay. Q&A. So I, will, I will just tell you, basically, Emma is telling us that she has early onset and she also has relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. MS is very quiet. Uh, she's planning to test the laser at ARC in Sydney in the new year. I'm not familiar with ARC, but you probably are. Uh, do you mm -hmm. have any special I considerations? Am. Do you have anything to maybe recommend to her or rec considerations you would like to share with her? Well, um... Emma, thanks for your question. I do know ARC, the Australian uh, Rehab Centre. It's run by Melissa McConaughey. She's she's fabulous. She's a, a an outstanding professional with loads and loads of experience. We have trained their team to use our laser devices. Uh, I know Melissa well. I trust her completely, and she's a consummate professional. They will give you great conservative advice. Uh, if you have any doubts or further questions, call Symbix directly. You don't need to do it through ARC, but we trust them and we have partnered with them. They are wonderful physiotherapists. Um, MS, good question. Uh, we will be looking at MS next year. There is the Australian MS conference in Perth coming up. I'll be attending it. There's so many overlaps. There's a gut-brain connection in MS. Um, we don't sell the device for MS. We're, we don't have the MS clearance yet or indication. We can't jump to uh, advice on MS, but autoimmune condition, inflammation-based, nervous system involvement, gut dysbiosis involvement, uh, very, very applicable. Um, you're in great hands with ARC and best of luck. Call us or email us if you have any concerns or questions any time. That's why we have a clinical support team. Thank you, Wayne. A question from Jill. She's asking whether you could advise on the use of probiotics with Symbix and how you, you believe the light affects the biome in particular. Yeah, Jill, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't advise on pro or prebiotics. Um, there is research out there. Um, uh, it's expensive, but do I personally believe it's effective? Yes. Um, the light would be a, a more natural way to improve the gut microbiome. But I'd, 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 in all fairness, I think, uh, you know, nutritionists, naturopaths, okay, let's stay with nutritionists. Let's, let's talk about like Rochelle Flanagan for a second. It was on last week. They're brilliant. We should have been listening to them 20 years ago. Uh, they know that there's a gut brain axis. They have been talking about leaky gut ad nauseum. How frustrating it must have been for them as a community, as a as a group of people, for people to be going to get advice from a neurologist to be told, you know, just chew another tablet and come and see me in a year from now. When when professionals like Rochelle have so much knowledge about how our body works. So yes, diet. I mean, I don't want to talk about probiotics but I want to talk about the benefits of a healthy diet, exercise, exposure to light, um, in addition to the pharmaceutical approaches. So I, that, that's probably where my expertise on probiotics stops. Um, Thank you, Wayne. That's fair enough. No worries. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, a question from someone anonymous here who basically wants to go z zero in on the mitochondria improvements. Um, and he's asking whether you know how the laser affects mitochondria dysfunction, and also, if so, how quickly would this happen? 
Yeah. So the laser masks mitochondrial dysfunction. It doesn't repair it. So we have no evidence to say that if you use the laser for three weeks, your mitochondrial dysfunction is solved. We know that consistent use of the laser is a stimulus that the mitochondria needs. It absorbs the light at the 904 wavelength um, at a certain pulse rate and frequency that's in this device. You don't have to know about that because you turn it on and it does it for you. And it produces more ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is a biochemical compound, which is the result of uh, mitochondrial function. And it's the little packet of energy. So little packets of, of stimulus that is sent around the body in the bloodstream to where you need it. So if you're running, it goes to your, your muscles and your lungs. If you're breathing, it, it's in, in your lungs. Um, it, it's what uh, drives life. So we know that it's absorbed and produces more ATP. Um, Thank you, Rim. There is a seminal piece of research by Dr. Mike Hamlin from 2017. He's uh, one of the, the founding fathers, if you will, of light therapy. He articulates this incredibly well in incredible detail. You need an organic chemistry knowledge to read his research, but he describes what I've just described far more scientifically and eloquently. That, that research is on our website. If you have a background in biochemistry, please look at it. Thank you very much. I just would like to say to our audience to maybe uh, hold back from asking any further questions because we have quite a large number of questions. Uh, and in all fairness, I don't think it will be possible to go through all of them. So I wouldn't want you to be disappointed. I will try to pick the ones that I think uh, are, are probably the most relevant and we will do the best to go through as many as we can. A question from Pilar Wayne, who is asking if mm -hmm. you know if the use of laser has an effect on the brain waves. It's a great question, Pilar. Thank you for answering that. Um, I don't know if the laser does um, brain waves. So I do know that the helmet does. Then that's basically the magic in the helmet, despite the fact that it's focused on the vagus nerve and the, the uh, occipital lobe of the skull. It's flashing light. I won't turn it on in case anyone has epilepsy or is photosensitive here. Again, I did it really quickly and turned it off. Um, it's flashing light at 40 hertz a second. 40 hertz is the fastest brainwave. So we have, I think, five, alpha, beta, delta, theta, and gamma. Yeah, alpha, beta, delta, theta, and gamma. Five. Okay. Um, gamma is the fastest. It's 40 hertz a second. Alpha dominates when you're sleeping. So it's one to three hertz a second. Beta is, I think, around 10. Delta is 10 hertz a second. So you they dominate when they're required to dominate. If you're at rest, you don't need a whole lot of executive function, cognitive processing. So gamma is sleeping. It's not dominant. This is stimulating gamma. This is flickering at the same rate of gamma. This is stimulating gamma and reinforcing gamma the analogy i would give you is it's almost a pacemaker for your brain it's setting a pace setting a rhythm that reinforces cognition so one of the non-motor symptoms i i, I actually f um, I failed to mention it sorry guys was reduced brain fog now how do you measure reduced brain fog well uh, it's hard right so anecdotally from over 5,000 customers, we get many people who say they feel more with it, just a bit sharper and able to engage more proactively in life. It's, it's one, of the, one of the most difficult and frustrating symptoms, at least in my experience with family that I saw. Um, so how does it reinforce gamma? we're into hypotheses and my guess is as good as yours. Does it reinforce it because the, the light is absorbed into the eye through the retina and the opsins behind the retina? Is it uh, stimulation that, you know, is absorbed through the skin into the bloodstream? We don't know. We don't know. But we do know that there are functional MRI reports uh, from, we haven't done these, one of our competitors has done that and they are oh, balloons 
time for me to stop the the answer um it's amazing how it's once an hour it's, it's the cue to shut up um so they've looked at functional mri results and you can show on a functional mri which means you know as you're doing something what area of the brain is actually active it's showing that you're increasing gamma so thanks Thank you, for Wayne. the question Thank you so great much. question now, an interesting yeah. question from Shane. Shane is asking whether the amount of fat on your belly affects the absorption in the gut, i.e. should skinny people versus fatter people have different intensity and times of the usage of the laser? Yeah, that's a good question, Shane. Um, so why not 30 minutes? Okay, I'll start with that. Why not 30 minutes? Because we don't have any research that shows that 30 minutes is more effective than 20 minutes. Uh, or 18 in the gut, two in the back of the neck. Um, we only have the research we have, which is why we need to do more clinical trials so we can optimize or perfect the dose. So we don't have any dose response data to, to show you a dose response curve, to show you it's more effective or less effective. So too much stimulation doesn't work, we know, and too little doesn't work. 20 minutes is an amount that we can show works. So that's where we're at if you're particularly large or have belly fat will it interfere yes absolutely it's a it's a it's a, a, a form of resistance absolutely the light has further to go and absorption won't be as good and a lot of that energy will be attenuated in the the the, the fat of the lipid cells um, but that's why we have clinical support that's why we don't want you to go online and buy a cheap knockoff on ebay you don't have the support and you don't know what you're buying the laser is uh why do we use laser i guess that begs the whole question of is laser more effective than led well absolutely we do not put led on the stomach because we believe you're wasting your time led is scattered light so all those pads you find make you feel good is that a placebo is that not a placebo we know that it's not going down to the gut we know that it's not being absorbed deep enough now, yes, cells communicate, but with the laser, you're giving it a better chance to get as far down as possible because laser light is coherent. It's perfectly parallel. It penetrates more deeply and it's a lot more intense. So if we can deliver laser without burning, which is what we do because this is non-thermal, uh, it's more effective. So, yeah, uh, if you are uh, larger and you have any doubts, please contact us and the good thing about this is it's a safe therapy. The safety profile is extremely high. It won't hurt you to increase the dose, but do not increase the dose without our advice because increasing the dose is more stimulus to your nervous system. And what we don't want is to bring on a bout of nausea or dizziness. Uh, God forbid the person has a fall because they're feeling lightheaded. It, it, it is the protocol for a reason. Um, we also have a lot of data on safety and contraindications, and it's part of the device. It's on the website. We'll tell you if you're uh, sensitive to light, don't use it. If you're pregnant, don't use it because we don't we don't have enough safety data. Everyone else tolerates it really well, except about one to three percent who who need a slower start. So they're not contraindicated. We just give them half the protocol to start with. If, you, if you're if you one of those unlucky 1% to 3% and you use the device and you feel a bit lightheaded or even your tremor might be a little worse temporarily, call us, email us. We'll take you off the therapy. We'll reintroduce it more slowly and one of our clinicians will work with you. So we, we'll make sure that you uh, have the optimal protocol and, and none of that's uh, permanent or transient. We have no one who we took off the therapy and started more slowly that whose, whose symptoms persisted. It, it's Thanks. really not an issue. Thank you, Wayne. A question from Adam, who basically remembers that you said you don't have the evidence to demonstrate. Actually, you haven't been able to, to, to test the products on young onset PD patients in particular so far. And he was asking whether that means that you would not recommend it to young onset people. I, I think no, but maybe you want to clarify that. Yeah, thanks. I will clarify that. Absolutely, yes, we recommend it uh, because we're dealing with over 5,000 people with Parkinson's. These are cleared for human beings, not young onset or late onset. Um, so perfectly safe for people. 
um, the the young onset, the theory three years ago, the hypothesis when we started was if there is a very strong genetic component, it would be more difficult to affect a positive change because of the strong genetics. Um, it's showing to be not true. So we have people who have young onset. They are uh, achieving as many benefits as people who did not have young onset. Can we show you a research paper which uh, compares and contrasts? No. Is it an important bit of research we will do? Yes. Is it perfectly safe? Absolutely. We, we strongly encourage people with young onset, if they're able to, to, to do this, if it's practical to work it into their weekly routine. Look, you've got to be committed, right? You can't use it once and say, you know, it didn't work. This is three times a week forever. Um, it's a commitment, but, you know, some people don't want to make that commitment. Well, we'd rather you don't start. If you have the time, if you're committed, by all means, uh, get in touch with us or purchase it, use it for 12 weeks, let us know, and one of our clinicians will engage with you. If you have any problems, of course, we will engage with you pre prior to the 12 weeks. Uh, Thank you great questions asked. Thank you so much. Mark is asking if you have considered testing the light therapy specifically on people who do not use levodopa. Of course, it would be a game changer. We, we, we do. Yes. Yeah, 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 we do. We absolutely do. Please, let's get away from the word testing. Uh, we're not testing it. Um, it's been tested. Does it affect somebody who doesn't take medication? Well, a lot of those uh, benefits are described on are unrelated to the gut inflammation and levodopa efficacy surviving the journey to the brain that's one benefit one benefit only the other benefit is it's still improving mitochondrial function it is if you use the helmet it, you're still getting the benefit of that gamma which is for the cognition the brain fog uh, that has got nothing to do with the levodopa um, look guys many people don't want to take or start levodopa um you know we, we have all sorts there is no distinction in efficacy between those who are on it and those who are not on it we have good results average results and unbelievable results across both groups thank you wayne still on the topic of trials which is an area of high interest from our audience have you tried have you planned any trials in the us is asking someone we yes we are planning a u.s trial um it's the the fda is a is a quite an interesting beast the fda will work on its own schedule with its own uh, uh, parameters and and really not put a lot of uh, e emphasis on what has been done in the rest of the world um rightly or wrongly it's just the way it is um a U.S. trial would be a very expensive undertaking uh, beyond our means today, but we're hoping that in the next two years we will commence a U.S. trial. Um, certainly having the Canadian trial, the Flinders trial, the trial in China, the trial in the U.K. will will go a long way to establishing, you know, a, a, a protocol that would give us and the FDA more confidence. So we, before you spend that kind of money, you want to be very sure that the FDA will accept the results of that trial. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit more education to go with the FDA. On that topic of education, I have a great question here that actually uh, I planned to ask you earlier. Someone basically says that um, he or she has asked several movement disorder specialists about the product, uh, light therapy, and they have all been unsupported, uh, unconvinced. Um, that person understands mm -hmm. there is a lot of research behind the product, but why are the specialists so close-minded to considering this as an add-on treatment? Um, you're, you're, you're now asking me to comment on human behavior, um, mm -hmm. and human behavior is, is uh, you know, an interesting subject, Michelle. Um, I, 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 look, a couple of responses to that. We are focused on our customers. They are the most important uh, uh, parts of what we are doing. We are very realistic and grown up and thick skinned about the challenge of implementing uh, for wide scale acceptance a new therapy. 
Um, it has been tried many times and there are as many failures as there have been attempts. Um, if I were daunted by what the movement specialist said today, uh, I would really give up and go home, but I'm not. Um, you've got to have an amount of courage. You have to have an amount of conviction and you have to have an amount of passion. And they're in equal parts because you need all three to draw on uh, when you start a, a new device in a new area, trying to convince a set of quite entrenched views. Um, now, the reality of Parkinson's is that uh, there's not much good news. I would say that the movement disorder specialists are equally frustrated as people with Parkinson's are. Uh, they don't have more than a few minutes every couple of months. There's not much uh, that they can draw on. Um, and oftentimes it's, you know, we we live in, 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 in the most incredible time in history where you have the internet and you have access to a podcast. So you guys do a lot of the filtering yourselves. So you don't have to uh, question whether exercise is good for you. You guys have done uh, the assessment and, and will bring people, reputable, credible people on that will talk about exercise and talk about nutrition and talk about diet. Um, you've, got a, you've got access to all this information. If your movement disorder specialist is not talking to you about all of these potential areas that can improve quality of life, you are with the wrong person. And I, don't, I think it's a generational issue. Um, uh, look, I, I have wonderful friends who are neurologists, but, but the ones that don't read widely and the ones that are not open-minded and have a constant open learning mind are typically not my friends. Um, not everyone has the time or the interest in extra reading. Most neurologists have a very rigorous training and then a very busy practice with a lot of information thrown at them and a lot of it is pharmaceutical trials. And, and that is just the reality. There is a political issue there. There is a time management issue there. And there is just a economic issue there, um, right? So let's be realistic. I mean, it's time to wake up and smell the roses, guys. You're not going to get great advice unless you read and you're your own advocate. And there is enough information out there for people to start reading and educating themselves. I would guess that those movement disorder specialists when they say they've read the research, are not aware of all the research, have not engaged in a call me up, call me up on my cell phone, because I'm open to talking to any neurologist out there about the research. Um, that's why we're doing more clinical trials, because we don't have that 100 person plus trial to satisfy the neurologist. But that was never the emphasis for the first three years. The emphasis was to get a device safety tested for basic efficacy in motor and non-motor, and that's what we've done with this. This is already a legal medical device. Um, satisfying the neurologist, it's a second level priority for me, for, for Symbix. We do realize they are gatekeepers. We do need to work with them as colleagues, and that's why we're doing larger clinical trials. It is an evolutionary process that is just gonna occur when and as it occurs. And we're about a year away from a year to a year and a half of enough clinical data for neurologists to start taking notice. Um, they're conservative by nature and they have to be. They have an important role to play. But if you're getting your advice from your neurologist, 2023, then I think you're getting very, very select, narrow advice. Some of them are wonderful, by the way. We are referred many patients by neurologists who are engaged with us, who are running clinical trials with us, who are presenting the results to the American, you know, um, neurological society last year. Um, so we have many neurologists who are friends, but the others will become our friends later on. We, we can't spend too much time worrying about what the neurologist in ethics thinks. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you very much. I think that we would all agree that, uh, um, even basic things such as exercise are never and not necessarily always being given the right level of consideration by certain neurologists. It all depends. And I think that it's important to find people who are open-minded and basically that think beyond just the medication. The medication is critical. 
but there is many many other things that we can do, and that's why we're holding those sessions like tonight. Uh, I think it's you know, Michelle. Think, uh, yes. One one more one more quick one more quick comment. Um, one of the the biggest disservices to people with Parkinson's or on medication is that there is no advice given on timing of medication. And uh, if we got timing right, we, we would increase efficacy dramatically. And the t so, so, so that means if you can afford it, it's always a big if, you know, it, it costs money to have a nutritionist. It costs money to go and see a physiotherapist. It costs money to go and see a psychologist. And, and, and that is beyond a lot of people. But there is now information and, and that's why your podcast is so important on how to time your medication. So how can everyone be on a similar protocol? It's, it's you know, there's Thank so you, many Andy. limitations. We've got to educate ourselves, guys. We, we, we need education and, and it's available. It's about initiative. Talking about money, can you tell us a bit more about the cost of your products and also their availability? I had some questions on cost, but also some people asking, uh, I live in Cambridge, is there support? Uh, I live in the US, is it available here? So if you can give us maybe the, the whole picture worldwide of how much it costs and, and where can it be accessed? Yeah, um, look, most of that information is just on our website. If you just go to simplexbiome.com, go to the product page, uh, all the costs in all the different currencies, but roughly this is 1950 Australian, so about 1400 US dollars. This is about a thousand to 1100 US dollars. Um, this is a this is available in the US. You can you can you can go online and buy it. This is available in Canada. This is a wellness device in the US. Okay, so we don't make uh, any claims in print that this is to reduce your Parkinson symptoms. So that's perfectly available, perfectly safe to use. Um, we're cleared through the EU, the UK, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand. We're working on US clearance for the for the laser. If you're unsure, contact infotempixbiome.com and we will put you in the right direction. Um, um, Yes, we would love to reduce the cost of these. Absolutely. You can't reduce the cost when you're a small batch manufacturer. So our volumes, even if you know we're, we're selling to 5,000, 6,000 patients, once we get to higher volumes, we will be able to drop the cost. Um, we get lots of frustrated uh, inquiries about if this was the real thing, you know, neurologists would be handing this out. Um, guys, we hear you, we feel your frustration. I would like nothing more than to hand them out. We go bankrupt. We can't do it. So there is no medical intervention where they hand it out. Um, it will it will come down. It will take off. It will get higher penetration. It, we're hoping that with the re trial results coming out, we will have enough data, particularly in the UK, to go to the NHS with the support of Parkinson's UK to get subsidization for it. So you, you can't do that unless you've got a, a, a big enough trial, UK-centric, people involved with the NHS, and that's what we have. So we're going to be starting that trial. But don't wait. It's, it's, it's a year before we get those results it'll be two to three years before we get it funded by the nhs thank you very much actually someone was asking a question about support by medicare in the us i don't know if you want to comment on this same same it. issue yeah. same same no unfortunately not unfortunately not no given the cost of the device not everyone will be able to afford both and keen is asking is the laser just as effective as the helmet or does one need both for pd so what would be your suggestion for someone who might just want to use the money the most wisely for one device instead of both? Find a friend and each buy a different one. Uh, um, no, uh, good question. This, the laser is really, in terms of the gut-brain axis, the focus of Symbix, our mission, uh, the science that we're built on, this is the, 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 the hero device. This is the foundation of light therapy. We strongly recommend this PD care device first. Um, if the cost is too prohibitive, then this is a cheaper device. Please, this is a great device, but they have different purposes. You know, this, if you're exercising 
very uh, uh, consistently, if you have a very good diet, if you're managing your stress, if you are doing all the things that you should be doing, you can probably add just the helmet, right? You, you've got the benefit of all those other interventions. The helmet would add to it, but it, we're talking about vagus nerve stimulation. We're talking about uh, gamma uh, brainwave reinforcement, different, different devices for different purposes. So please start with the device. The, the the laser device that's the the most important one but if you can't go to this one but supplement what the laser is doing with supplements diet exercise rest Can you hear me? Hi, Michelle. I think you're on mute. Oh, I'm uh, okay. Sorry, I thought it was my speakers. I'm back. Michelle, I can't hear you. Uh, Here we go. Yeah, yeah. I think it was it was mine running out of. Okay, are we okay now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. No I apologize. The mea culpa default was entirely mine. <laughs> a question from Shane. Shane is asking whether the effect of using the devices wears off over a long time period. Now, you told us that once you start with those devices, you're going to be using them your whole life. But actually, if you were to go on holiday and be unable to travel with them, for instance, uh, how yeah. long do the effects last? Um, Shane, thank you. It, it takes a while to build up. So that's why, you know, we, we do ask for patience during the first 10 to 12 weeks, and then we'll do a reassessment if, if you're not completely satisfied. Um, and it does have a slow declining effect. If you stop using the devices, it doesn't just fall off a cliff. So the, the research that we have done, the trial in um, Sydney uh, on the helmet device, which was a six month trial, we had a one month washout period between the first three months and the second three months. So we treated the, the cohort for three months. We then stopped treatment for both the, the, the sham arm as well as the live arm. And then we had the, the sham arm start the live treatment because ethics is difficult to get when you're not providing benefit to people who have had a sham. Um, so everyone got the live treatment and we measured the effect after one month of, of not using the device. We had a very small diminution in the benefits after four weeks. So if you're going away for a weekend or a week, no problem. You're starting to see some drop off in the effect after a month, but not much. After that, I don't know how quickly the the uh, drop off happens. I don't know the what the the the, the gradient of that curve looks like. Um, but but I, I mean, I you could travel with this. This is such a small, easy to transport device. It's a battery driven device. You take it through in hand luggage or even check luggage. Same with this. Um, the only trick with this is there's a lithium ion battery, and the lithium ion battery needs to go in your hand luggage. Do not check lithium ion batteries in at the airport. So as long as this little guy, it's like a cell phone, it's like a mobile phone. As long as that's in your hand luggage, you're fine. And there's a carry case that this comes with. It is a bit bulky. I do understand that. Um, but if you didn't take that for a few weeks, uh, you know, just start it when you come back. Uh, most importantly is to manage your anxiety around it. We don't want people to be anxious. Uh, mm. Having missed a day or two, anxiety is, is the worst thing for symptoms. So just be comfortable it's a very very gentle intervention uh, it's a very soft intervention uh, so i have a question yeah. from a question from charles who basically says if light boosts good bacteria why doesn't it also boost bad bacteria or can you differentiate that's a good question yeah it's a very good question um it, it, it's it's basically reducing inflammation and inflammation 
is um, creating havoc with the bacteria that flourishes in an inflammatory environment versus the bacteria that do not flourish. Um, if you eat a lot of sugar, refined sugar, your, you will change your gut microbiome composition towards uh, gram-negative, lipopolysaccharide-rich bacteria, which are toxic. And it's that lipopolysaccharide-producing uh, bacteria that is now being linked to uh, leaky gut, alpha-synuclein clumping. So processed sugars are the worst thing you can add to your diet. Um, you will find the bacteria shift towards the bacteria that thrive in that sugar-rich environment or that highly inflammatory environment. So the laser light's not that smart. The bacteria smart. You create the right environment, the good bacteria proliferate. You create a bad environment, the bacteria, the bad bacteria proliferate. Now, it's not to say you shouldn't have good and bad bacteria in your gut. We have both. We have... Um, Helicopylori bacteria in our gut, in every healthy gut. Helicopylori bacteria is the bacteria that's involved in uh, stomach ulcers, for example. It's one of the key strains of bacteria that uh, metabolize your dopamine, your levodopa, and turn it into active dopamine in the gut, therefore not making it available to, to do its work in the brain where, where you guys need it. So if you can reduce the helicopylori bacteria, that's a positive environment. The helicopylori bacteria thrives in an inflammatory environment where you have a sugar-rich diet, which is why diet is so important in Parkinson's. If you're not getting this advice from your neurologist, we have to get this advice ourselves. So, so please start to at least be familiar with these issues there's some wonderful people to 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 read about rochelle flanagan subscribe to her instagram she talks about this stuff all the time laurie michley uh you can get these links through the symbix website or through the, the no silver bullet for parkinson's who have had both guests on the program before they'll they'll, they'll talk about what a good diet looks like so uh, no, the bacteria is not that smart. The laser is not that smart, but we've we've got to be smarter than both of them. Thank you, Wayne. Can you still hear me? Yes. Good, because I think that I'm running out of batteries on my AirPods. Um, Angela is going to have DBS early next year. No, I know we spoke about uh, DBS with respect to the helmet in particular, but she's saying that she will have her implant not in her chest but in her abdomen. And her question is more about the PD care. Would she still be able to use the PD care if the implant is in the abdomen? Um, I need to think about that. Um, I don't want to give an answer too glibly. It depends on where it is implanted. Do I? Do I? Do I believe? No, it's not good enough. Uh, what does the research say? We don't have enough research. So I would say we would need to proceed with caution. We would need to bring your neurologist or neurosurgeon into the discussion, and if the team was comfortable, that's a basis to proceed. But that's a very uh, special circumstance. Um, I believe you will find a solution that works for everyone. But we will not uh, cut across a DBS surgeon and implant something uh, that is that sorry that is implanted and provide another form of stimulus because it creates anxiety in the team and that anxiety then is filtered down to you. So uh, managing the the situation professionally and appropriately is always preferred and and we're happy to engage with you at the right time, but it, it depends on a lot of factors. Thank you very much, Wayne. Charles is asking, uh, some competing products have a nasal device. Is it something you have considered? Yes, and we will have one next year. Please wait for ours or buy the competitors. Um, it's currently uh, clumsy and uncomfortable, but it's very effective. That's really nice. Um, Jerry was asking about the, the the laser, whether it basically penetrates at the cellular level in the in the in the in the biome. Does it touches the cellular level itself? I think that this is a, the, of course the point you made about mitochondria. So the answer to that yeah. is yes, I guess. Yeah, mitochondria circulates. Uh, I think it was in the last five years uh, there was some very good research showing that mitochondria actually circulates in the blood um, and goes to every organ in the body. So yes. 
uh, cells also have this amazing capacity to communicate one to the other. So even though you're affecting cells at the epidermis level or the dermis level uh, beneath the epidermis, you, you, you're you setting off a chain reaction of communication from one cell to the next, to the next, to the next. So you don't have to get the light into the abdomen or into the colon itself. Um, yeah. Thank you. You mentioned, of course, that the light, light therapy is not new. Uh, and uh, I had a question here about using PD care for relieving arthritic pain. Is it possible to use it for non-neurodegenerative diseases like arthritis in particular? Yes. Uh, uh, the, the cold laser technology was invented to reduce pain and inflammation. It was first cleared as a medical device for reduction in pain and inflammation. So it can substitute as a physiotherapy aid. Um, it's effective. It it uh, it blocks pain signals. Um, it's good for chronic pain. Um, it, there is also uh, a, a mechanism of action, which is not my work or Symbix's work. It, it, this is the work of of some really smart scientists like Dr. Roberta Chow, Dr. Anne Liebert. These are brilliant women who um, have, have have done a lot of work in this area. Uh, PhDs in pain management and channelopathies. So you can treat migraine headaches with laser therapy. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, Michelle, was, while you and I were having a chat at Will Parkinson's, we had a line outside the Symbix booth and many people came to the booth and said, uh, we have terrible neck cramping. Okay. Does your laser help for that? And we're like, you know, I don't know if this is actually allowed at in Barcelona at Will Parkinson's, but please have a sit here. And and one of my uh, colleagues and clinicians used the laser on the it's dystonia. Everyone knows what dystonia is. It's a rigidity and uh, un called uh, un uh, controllable um, uh, cramping and uh, uh, trembling of muscles, um, causing significant musculoskeletal pain and uh, discomfort. We were able to help more than a handful of chronic dystonia sufferers. Now, that was suffering. We had a, a lady from Japan who couldn't move her neck, who, had, who was in tears. We used the laser and then obviously uh, as uh, manual therapists, uh, physical therapists with a little bit of soft tissue work, so touching people, it's such a, an, an uncommon thing in medicine. Touch people. God forbid we should touch someone. Using your hands in a therapeutic manner on the muscles of the neck with the laser, we had a big smile on someone's face who had been in distress for you know two weeks since she got off a plane from Japan. Um, so yes, this can be used. But physiotherapy is a wonderful, wonderful uh, modality for releasing pain associated with Parkinson's. The Lancet Journal had uh, some some terrific research done a few years ago. They said up to, I think it was 75% of people with Parkinson's have severe uh, muscle pain, cramping. So the lasers are great. But using the laser over those pain areas with massage or soft tissue work even more effective so there is no one uh, silver bullet thank you very much there is no silver yep. bullet we told you <laughs> no, there isn't one now cody has any question as frustrating as that is to all three of us on this podcast and and, and hundreds of people you yep. need a holistic approach absolutely yep. cody is asking an interesting question how would this work on non-parkinson's people would, this, would there still be benefits to people well you just explained here an, an, ex an example you just gave us an example here of using the laser for non-necessarily parkinson specific topics like arthritis but if you were using the light therapy generally on people who don't have parkinson's does it still have benefits um I think investing in a you know uh, fourteen hundred US dollar device uh, is a commitment if you don't have Parkinson's. But but you know if if that's what you want to do, um, yes, it can be used for pain and inflammation. Well, we have other lasers. We have a red laser 
called Dermacare. It's on the website. It's actually really effective for peripheral neuro neuropathic pain, peripheral neuropathy, which many uh, um, uh, chemotherapy and diabetic patients develop. So because of the, the high levels of uh, glucose in the blood, uh, nerve endings and blood vessels are damaged in the periphery, so it, towards the fingertips and the and the toes, uh, because they're not very big vessels and they don't have good circulation, and and that results eventually in necrosis and cell death and tissue death, and amputation, um, and we're getting wonderful results with that. Um, it's why it's one of the reasons why I found out about light therapy so many years ago, because I was working in a physiotherapy practice in Sydney, and I had all these patients who were taking opioids to manage their pain. Many of them um, had peripheral neuropathy. And I started reading because I, I actually couldn't address the situation. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I saw, I went to the literature and I found that Red light in particular is effective at producing nitric oxide, which is a natural compound that is vasodilative, which means it widens blood vessels. So what is the consequence of wider blood vessels? You get greater blood and oxygen perfusion, particularly to the heart to get pinkies. So if you're getting fresh blood supply, you're improving not only the feeling, but the tissue health saving off, uh, uh, you know, surgery. Um, and then I started reading about light therapy and I found about, I found out about the application of light for neurodegenerative conditions, including Parkinson's research done on mice. And they gave the mice Parkinson's through injecting them with methamphetamine. Um, and they used the light to relieve symptoms in controlled animal trials at Sydney University Medical School. And this was a team of neuroscientists who preceded me, some of whom went on to found Symbix with me. You know, Dr. Anne Liebert was, was involved in that. Uh, so these are amazingingly bright people. And then they gave the mice a vagotomy. They cut the vagus nerve and the treatment stopped working on the mice. This is all published research, by the way. It's all, it's all out there. You just have to find the research. Um, they, they cut the vagus nerve and the mice stopped reacting to the light therapy. And they used this device. This uh, just it looked kind of a little different on the mice. Um, and then they realized there was a gut brain connection. And that's where the whole gut microbiome brain connection and treating the gut came from. But it was through allied uh, uh, or, or sort of parallel applications of the technology for pain and inflammation. Thank you, Wayne. Let me just go to a few rapid fire questions. Sometimes sure. we have already provided the answer, but people are asking for clarifications. Susan is asking the difference between duo care and PD care. If I remember well, the, the duo care is faster. It's a more expensive product that pro provides the same service, but at a faster speed. Yeah, instead of treating for 18 minutes on the gut and two on the neck, you can treat for about six and a half minutes in total. So it cuts the treatment time down by three. It also has a rechargeable lithium ion battery in the bigger device. So you don't have the, um, the, the need to replace, even though you can use rechargeable batteries in this device, you still have to open it, replace the batteries. And, and, and yes, it's not ideal for somebody with, with a, a significant tremor. You will need help to do that. So we're going to come out with a device that, that solves that problem. We are working on devices for next year. Now we're at least a year away. So again, do not wait, please. We will let you know when we're about to launch a new device with plenty of time, but we are working on a device that is a wearable device that will make it a lot easier. So a lot of money is going into a belt device, which will make treatment much simpler. That's interesting. Okay, so a few more rapid fire. One for me, Maria is asking if there will be a recorded copy of this meeting. Yes, there will be a recording. Actually, we are recording right now. And we will be posting it on our YouTube channel in a, either tomorrow or the next day. So everyone can see it again if they want to. Susan is asking, when, when will the laser be approved in the US? Now, you told us, I think, that the helmet is already approved in the US. But is the laser yep. already approved? 
No, the la- we're working with the FDA, and that's uh, subject to the clinical trial. Now, it w- yes. as long as we don't advertise this is for Parkinson's, this is already uh, a, a category of light device that is exempt from uh, US FDA clearance. So it, they've made a special category for light devices that um, – you do not need FDA clearance for. So you can buy it as a wellness device. It's it, We get into the territory of being very technical. So that's why it's just better to contact info at simbixbiome.com yes. uh, and we will advise you on how to, how to get this. Now, Chris Sutpin tells me, it's not really a question. Please tell Wayne, Chris and Eric say hi. So this is hi from Chris and Wayne. So oh, thank you. Friend. Thanks, guys. It's, it's they're fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I look forward to talking to you both. They're they're awesome. part of the Parkinson's community, and I love those guys. Good stuff. Cathy is asking. I think we we answered that, but let's just go through it again. Cathy is asking if there are any negative side effects in using the Simbix products. Cathy, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I I touched on them briefly, but just quickly, there is on the Symbix website, www.symbixbiome.com, there is a link at the very bottom of the homepage to contraindications and safety precautions. Uh, They sound draconian because they have to be legally. Um, Basically, you you have a small 1% to 3% chance of something called dysautonomia. Dysautonomia means... Uh, you, there's a, a further dysregulation to your nervous system. So that can manifest as a, a slight increase, and I say slight, a moderate increase in tremor, a moderate increase in, in you know, uh, balance, uh, a disorder or deficit. You might find you feel a bit nauseous. You, you, you've been stimulated unnaturally and, and you, your body's like, wow, what was that? I don't feel great. If that happens, it's benign, it's transient. We can address it. Um, if that happens, contact us straight away and we will help you. We have a 100% track record of helping people who experience those very mild uh, temporary symptoms. This is a very safe uh, uh, therapy with clinical trial data to support it. So uh, be confident, please. A very targeted question from Donna. She's asking whether g- the gut light therapy has any effect on two nail fungus as an added bonus. She she refers to the fact that Laura Michley uh, has said that a lot of people with Parkinson's have two nail fungus. Thank God I don't. Uh, um, yes, it does, but not unfortunately not the PD care. The PD care is infrared light. Infrared light is a longer wavelength than red, which means it penetrates more deeply. So you want it for the gut because it, you want it to penetrate as deep as possible. So that's why we use infrared for the gut. And you can't see infrared because it's outside of the visible light spectrum. If you use red light, red laser light, and again, LED is not going to cut it, guys, because it's diffuse light, it's reflected, it refracts, it bounces off the surface. Most of it will just bounce right back into your eye and into the environment. If you use a red laser, okay, in the 600 wavelength, now, very self-serving, it's our derma care. But it's, it's, if you're just using it for toe fungus, there might be other remedies out there, but it's not it's not toxic because this is non-pharmaceutical. My daughter, I, and, she, and she has forbid me to post pictures of her toe on social media. She will kill me. She has resolved tail, uh, uh, toenail fungus with our red light dermacare. So not duo care, that's different. Duo care is the Parkinson's, the, the, the uh, sort of the Ferrari model. Dermacare, which is a red light laser. Derma, as in derma, the skin. It's a shorter wavelength and it penetrates less deeply. It's focused more on topical issues. Mm. It's used for acne. It's used for uh, dermatitis, uh, scarring. Um, That's why there's a booming cosmetic industry for light therapy. You see all these masks. There's I won't mention the brands here, but so many of them online because red light is more superficial light means it's it's superficial with cosmetic. I don't mean that way. I mean, please use it if you want to. Um, The red light penetrates at the skin level, surface level. It builds collagen. It improves wrinkles. There's a lot of research out there. 
but it's a massive, massive uh, money-making industry. It's one of the biggest new industries in the US. Tons of money going into it. Um, that is great for a, a wide area, but if you have stubborn toenail fungus, a focused red laser like our Dermacare is the best option. Thank you, Rain. We're going to run out of time for questions, but I just wanted to pick up this one from Shined, who is basically talking about the interchangeability of the three devices. In particular, if you put the helmet on your abdomen, would it also affect with the red light, the gut microbiota? No, because the helmet's an LED device. It scatters light. Because of the shape of the helmet, the light is largely contained in the uh, the rear, the, the, the posterior brain sort of skull and neck um so it's a nice contained cocoon um but it's led light led light will not penetrate if you just put it onto the stomach it's the wrong shape and it the light will just scatter you need a laser right so that's the difference between the symbix laser medical laser and a lot of the red light pads you you find out there that are that cost a fraction of the price you're getting what you're paying for there, there is a difference in efficacy. And if you're going to, I mean, your biggest resource is your time. If you're going to spend hours and hours a month using this therapy and you're putting a red light pad on your stomach, um, yeah, it's, it's not going to have any, any metabolic effect. Thank you. I will keep maybe a last question from Ali on which I will elaborate slightly. Ali is asking if the light enters the eyes, and if you consider the fact that the interaction between the light and the eyes to be therapeutic. My addition to that is that I read on some forums that some people were concerned about the negative impact it could have on the eyes. So can you touch on the topic of the light and the eyes, whether it is therapeutic or whether it could be problematic? Uh, horses for courses. If you put a high-powered laser in your eye, that's a terribly uh, destructive thing to do Where, where's that cutoff point i don't know i'm not an ophthalmologist um do we recommend that you put any of this light directly in your eye absolutely not so the duo care comes with eye goggles and you you know we strongly recommend you use it uh the pd care is a, a class one laser safe for home use which uh, ac accommodates people who are silly enough to put the laser right into their eye. Please don't do it. Um, if you're putting a high powered laser into your eye, you, you, the consequences could be, you know, very negative. Conversely, red light, there is quite a lot of published research now on the use of cold laser therapy. And, th you know, this would be considered a cold laser. Um, so similar technical parameters for diabetic uh, retinopathy. So um, as I said, diabetics typically have damage to the peripheral uh, blood vessels, the vasculature. One of the smallest set of uh, uh, capillaries in the in the entire human body are basically in the retina behind the the retina in the eye. So blindness, diabetic blindness is a is a huge problem. Cold red laser is now being trialed for that in a very controlled clinical environment. So it's not something to be tried at home or, or the, the, the negative consequences are material and long lasting. Please don't shine any laser devices in your eye. Uh, are you going to damage your retina by looking at uh, some red LED at this intensity with a battery? No. Uh, but we don't want you to do it, please. We don't have enough data. It's a, it's a different area of, of medicine. There is an application, but that's not what Symbix is about. Wayne, thank you very, very much for your time today. Um, it was a very early start at seven, quarter to seven in the morning in Sydney, but to really appreciate your availability and uh, your generosity with your time and your attitude in general towards the Parkinson's community. So thank you very much. It's uh, it's it's a great pleasure. It's such a great honor to be on this podcast. I think I think this is the platform to be on in the Parkinson's world. I'm a consumer of your your podcast. I've listened to every single one. Um, I hope this is interesting. I hope this is the best. I hope this gets lots of views. Thank you again for the platform, guys. And I want to thank you for all your advocacy. 
um, you guys are both inspirational to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can definitely say that actually we have answered close to 50 questions. Well, you have answered close to 50 questions today, which is, I think, an all-time record. I do realize there is like around 10 questions we haven't answered. I do apologize to those people, but I think we can be quite happy with the uh, performance of our speaker tonight. So thank you, Wayne. And before we say goodbye, good night, or good day, I just wanted to tell everyone that on the 11th of December, we will be hosting our next session and we will have, be having Professor Bas Bloom, one of the authorities on Parkinson's worldwide. We have already had the pleasure of listening to him last year. So 11th of December will not be on exercise this time, it will be on nutrition. So nutrition and Parkinson's 11th of December with Professor Bas Bloom, the invitations will be sent in the next week or 10 days. Thank you everyone. Wayne, have a great day. And to everyone in, the, in different parts of the world, for whatever is left of your day, whether it is a lot or very little like for us, I wish you a great time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night, guys. Thanks,